Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real delight to welcome all of you to uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, of course, but to Congress 2012 and to our community. A very special welcome to our Governor General, David Johnston, who I think is experiencing a welcome home. Um, our Governor General is a a deeply respected and a well-loved figure in our community. So David, a special welcome to you. Thanks for being here. Um, Congress has been underway for over 80 years. And it's an annual event that celebrates the engagement of scholars in the humanities, the social sciences, in deeply complex issues. They get together, they share ideas, they uh, very much learn from one another. They advance ideas that are not only complex, but that attempt to help all of us to understand a, a very complex world, one which has increasing challenges. Uh, we are a smaller and smaller globe every year. The integration of values across cultures, across religions, is deeply, deeply difficult and it's the kind of activity that Congress celebrates. Ambiguity, complexity, ideas of values, of truth, beauty, justice, all of those things. So Congress is a celebration of the intellect, but it's also a celebration of the application of intellect to the deeply troubling issues of the world, the ones that are the most beautiful, that are the most celebrated. It's an opening of the imagination. And I think it's a fabulous opportunity for all of us to celebrate what is wonderful about our species, our intellectual capacity. I also want to welcome all of you to our community. Our community has reinvented itself uh, numerous times over many decades. It is a community that is proud of that reinvention. Uh, we have tomorrow, Sunday, you can go north of the city to the campus of Research in Motion or to Tom Jenkins Open Text campus and you'll see horses and buggies. It's the juxtaposition of tradition with the new technology that is so celebrated in this region. So I hope all of you very much enjoy your engagement with Congress. Uh, we have the Deep Thinkers series. If anyone is a deep thinker amongst us, it's David Johnston. I'm very much looking forward to uh, your comments, uh, Your Excellency. And I hope that all of you very much enjoy not only the session this afternoon, but all of your engagements with Congress. And welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. Alors, euh, j'aimerais signaler avant de commencer que la traduction simultanée est assurée pour cette conférence. Vous pouvez retirer les euh, écouteurs euh, dans l'hall situé euh, à l'extérieur de la salle de théâtre. It is indeed a great pleasure, Max, to be here in Kitchener-Waterloo on this, the first official day of Congress. And I'd like to thank Wilfrid Laurier University and Waterloo University for the remarkable hospitality that we are already experiencing. I'd also like to thank our partners at the Association for Universities and Colleges of Canada for making community participation possible at this year's Big Thinking series. And finally, I would like to thank the Canada Foundation for Innovation for sponsoring the Big Thinking Speaker Series. As many of you know, the CFI provides important funding to build Canada's capacity to undertake world-class research and support innovation across disciplines and institutions. Of course, along with these partners, we are very pleased that His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnson, Governor General of Canada, has come to speak with us today. When the Right Honourable David Johnson was installed as the 28th Governor General of Canada on the 1st of October, 2010, his remarks focused on a smart and caring nation, a call to service. He has since travelled widely across Canada, speaking with Canadians about the importance of giving, learning 
innovation, and family, and asking them what they will contribute to Canada as we approach our country's 150th birthday in 2017. His Excellency was born and raised in Northern Ontario. His twin passions for learning and sport led to an undergraduate degree at Harvard University, as well as his induction as a hockey player into Harvard's Athletic Hall of Fame. To law degrees at the University of Cambridge and Queens, and to a lifelong dedication to higher education. During his 44-year academic career, he served as Dean of the Law School at the University of Western Ontario in London, as Principal of McGill University in Montreal, and most recently as President of the University of Waterloo. He served on many provincial and federal task forces and committees, as well as on the boards of a number of companies. He married his high school sweetheart, Mrs. Sharon Johnston, who trained as a physical and occupational therapist and ran a successful horse training center for 12 years. And together, they have five daughters and eight grandchildren. I would now like to invite His Excellency, the Right Honorable David Johnston, to deliver his big thinking address. Merci, Graham, for votre introduction très spéciale. And thank you also, Max, for your uh, warm words. Yes, I have come home. It's great to be home. You know, Max, you referred to the Big Thinking Conference and uh, me as a big thinker. I was quite flattered by that when I received the invitation, and then I made the mistake of telling my wife that I was a big thinker. <laughs> and she told me about the man who went to a pet store because he thought the home needed a little livening up. And he wanted to buy a parrot, and he said to the owner of the pet store, he said, uh, that uh, green parrot over there, what's that cost? That's $500, $500 for a parrot. Why so much? Well, that parrot can operate a computer. What about the blue parrot over here? $1,000, $1,000 for a parrot. What's special about that parrot? That parrot can program a computer. What about the red parrot back there? Well, that red parrot's $5,000. Wow, $5,000 for a parrot. What's so special about that parrot? The owner says, well, sir, we really don't know. To be frank with you, it doesn't do anything. Whatever it says is totally, mis can't be understood. But parrot one and parrot two call him a big thinker. <laughs> Dr. Blau, Dr. Hamdlopper, Dr. Carr, Mr. Braid, academic students, Scholars all, good afternoon. Je vous remercie de m'avoir invité à ouvrir ce congrès multidisciplinaire renommé. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to return to Waterloo. It's wonderful to be back among so many cherished friends in a place where my family and I spent 12 marvelous years. Today I want to talk about a dream of mine, a true democracy of knowledge. What exactly is it? To democratize something is to make it accessible to everyone. A democracy of knowledge, therefore, deepens and broadens knowledge so that it's available to all citizens in a given society and beyond them to all citizens and individuals throughout the world. When I speak of knowledge, I speak of something specific. <clears throat> knowledge is that next to highest state on the progressive spectrum that moves from data through information, from knowledge to wisdom with wisdom being the ultimate plateau from which knowledge is applied to govern all aspects of the ideal society. As scholars in Canada today, we are privileged. This is the best time in history to be scholars, to be knowledge workers, the best time in history to be doing what we're doing. Never before have the conditions for the democratization of knowledge been better, nor the critical thinking of scholars more central to the lives of Canadians and people throughout the world. For about 45 years before my installation as Governor General, I had the pleasure and privilege of immersing myself in the world of academic scholarship, beginning as a law professor and then later for almost 27 years as a university president. My wife jokes a bit about that as well. She was once asked, my heavens, your husband's been a president for a very long time. What's the secret to success? She said, well, 
Success is a very ambiguous concept, let me not go into that, but my husband uh, is totally lacking in a sense of humor and therefore he's perfect for the job. <laughs> As a scholar, a Canadian scholar, I believe we must reconsider the role of scholarship in how we apply our learning and how we make our knowledge more widely available to Canadians and how we further democratize knowledge for all people. I use the words Canadian scholar deliberately. Canada has already played an impressive role in the democratization of knowledge and continues to have an enormous amount to offer the world. Yet as Canadians, we're humbled about our accomplishments and vividly conscious of the work that remains to be done. And this gathering is a vital component of our work as Canadian scholars. Over the course of the next week, you will seek to uncover answers to a fundamental question. How do we redefine scholarship in our world to democratize knowledge further? As Governor General, I've often spoken of the importance of seeing things whole. It's a phrase from E.B. White, that marvelous writer, among other things, of children's books like uh, Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little, editor of The New Yorker. He spoke about the importance of seeing things whole. And I would say seeing things whole in our efforts to build a smarter, more caring nation that Graham referred to at the outset. I want to consider the advantage of seeing things whole as we evolve our understanding of the kind of scholarship required in the 21st century. I'll start by drawing on the thinking of the late Ernest Boyer, longtime president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Two decades ago, Dr. Boyer published Scholarship Reconsidered, an influential report in which he highlighted the usefulness of the term scholarship to encompass a wide range of academic work, from pure and applied research to teaching and civic engagement. He wrote, surely scholarship means engaging in original research, but the work of the scholar also means stepping back from one's investigation, looking for connections, building bridges between theory and practice, and communicating one's knowledge effectively to students. Boyer's proposal was to craft a new, defini a new definition of scholarship based on four distinct yet interrelated functions. Boyer proposed the scholarship of discovery, which enables us to create essential new knowledge through basic and applied research. The scholarship of integration, which empowers us to recognize that the complex problems we face cannot be solved in isolation. Do we have much to learn from each other? As Einstein once said, for every complicated question, there's a simple and wrong answer. The scholarship of application, through which we animate learning by putting theory into practice, and finally, the scholarship of teaching, through which we synthesize learning and transmit it for the benefit of all. Boer's ideas about scholarship are by now familiar to most of us. They've become a foundation of our new, broader definition of the university's role in society. Time and experience have proven their merit. As our world has become more globalized and complex, the relevance of this more holistic approach to post-secondary education has deepened. Yet the rapid and profound changes we're living through compel us to dig deeper into Boyer's profound insights into scholarship. Well, it's been only two decades since the publication of Scholarship Reconsidered, the context in which we learn today has changed considerably. Let me start with developments in the first of Boyer's four functions of scholarship, discovery. As we all know, the speed, complexity, and depth of our learning today are quite unprecedented. Over the course of the next 40 years, it's estimated that science will create more knowledge than has been created in all of human history. The mind boggles. New tools are powering our revolutionary advances in knowledge to the telescope and microscope, which enable us to see far and to see small. We've added the computer and the internet, which enable us to find, gather, store, relate, and experiment with everything we know. In short, to see wide and deep. The mapping of the human genome, one of the single most important scientific discoveries in history, perhaps the most important was the result of the dynamic interaction of medicine and computer science, one of the many new disciplinary hybrids in our smarter world. Harnessed to the internet, the computer has made it possible for us to share and store information to an extent never before imagined. 
An example within the humanities is found right here in Waterloo, where OpenText developed an online search engine for the Oxford English Dictionary to produce a second edition that marries digital dig data collection with software synthesis. The previous edition used handwritten index cards. My great friend Tom Jenkins, who uh, is the the guru of open text uh, handed me uh, his, it was the fourth book you've published, Tom, just a moment ago, uh, not simply telling the open text Oxford English Dictionary story, but speaking about some of the things I've mentioned just a moment ago. This remarkable resource eloquently demonstrates the power of new tools to extend our learning and increase our ability to share and access knowledge, in this case, the authoritative history and definition of every word in the English language. <clears throat> L'évolution et l'ampleur des découvertes scientifiques sont plus impressionnantes que jamais. Et ce phénomène transformera sans pour autant amenuiser le rôle fondamental que les sciences humaines et sociales jouent dans nos vies. The many disciplines they comprise are vital in two ways. First, to place in context within our civilization this accumulation of discoveries, and second, to animate the cultures and souls of our respective societies that bring these discoveries to life, the beauty, the virtue, the justice that Max spoke about a moment ago. This point naturally brings me to recent developments in the scholarship of integration. The complex problems we face today cannot be solved in isolation. This was certainly true in Ernest Boyer's day, yet rapid globalization and the internet have made interdisciplinary study and collaboration more essential than ever. The work of University of Toronto urban theorist Richard Florida demonstrates the importance of fostering a diverse mixture of talent, technology, and tolerance, the three T's within our communities. When cheap people achieve the right balance of creativity, communication, cooperation, scholarship is enhanced and healthier communities emerge. A curious feature about increased connectivity is that it both enables and requires greater collaboration. Consider the fact that we now generate and store online 2.5 exabytes of computer data every day, or in simpler language, that means that every two days we're uploading more data than has been printed in all of human history. Many of the implications of intense and expansive connectivity have yet to be seen. Yet what we can discern is the growing need for us to work together and learn one another's disciplinary languages. Why? Well, because each advance in science and technology has a ripple effect on our culture and society. Many people often underappreciate this truth. The humanities and social sciences are essential in helping us to avoid unintended consequences and innovate socially as we move from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. I had a wonderful example of that. I was thinking just as I came into this, this great community. <clears throat> we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the University of Waterloo three or four years ago. It was the particular Monday in January that was the birthday, and we had a wonderful party at uh, noon on campus with staff and faculty and students. And then we had a reception about 5 o'clock in the afternoon for all the elected representatives. Peter, I think you were there, of uh, municipal government, regional government, uh, provincial government and federal government, and it was our attempt to say to these elected officers, thank you for your work in building a university that is important to our community, your predecessors and you today. And as I, w I the remarks I prepared the night before had the theme, this university belongs to this community. It was created by the community. And as I was going out the door to this five o'clock reception, one of our our uh, public relations people said, have you read the local newspaper today and seen the editorial? I said, no, I typically read it in the evening. And it was celebrating our 50th anniversary. But the headline of the lead editorial was, this community belongs to this university. They'd inverted it. <laughs> and so when I got there, I sent the newspaper clipping around, and then I gave my remarks. And I said, you know, neither is wrong. Both are true. There's a symbiotic relationship with this community that is very special and led to, has led to very important consequences for our community. Let's consider the third element of scholarship, applying it in our communities and thus in our world. The campus community collaboration 
fostered by United Way Centraid and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, is quite simply a superb initiative. Under Chad Gaffield's leadership just a few moments ago, uh, 18 or 20 of us spent uh, an hour and a half together uh, taking to the next stage an initiative that Chad caused to start about a year ago on bringing the campus and the community together in uh, very, very collaborative ways. I'm terribly excited about this, and I think we're on a roll, and uh, we will see more of this. Is the announcement uh, of yesterday public, uh, yes. Chad? And uh, Minister Goodyear announced uh, yesterday a $70 million investment in uh, campus community collaborations, an outstanding first start to this. This will help us ensure that social innovation is a key component of Canada's innovation landscape, and we must be as good at social innovation as we are at technological innovation. This campus community initiative also provides us with a catalytic vehicle to apply knowledge and develop experiential learning. I often fancy that the most practical thing in the world is a good general theory, especially when it's continually tested and refined against reality. The application of knowledge in our communities enables us to refine both theory and practice. We can't overstate the importance of testing our assumptions and showing humility in our scholarship. In the rage of financial information, financial engineering two or three years ago, I used to quote that famous statement that comes from applied statistics, mathematics, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. <laughs> I recently had the privilege of presenting a Killam Prize to the University of Western Ontario University's John Wally. John is considered by several measures Canada's leading research economist and the top-ranked publishing ed economist in his field. <clears throat> in his acceptance speech, John spoke very, very candidly. He confessed the failure of applied economics to foresee how excess leverage in the financial markets would make us vulnerable to financial collapse. And the collapse, of course, Wall Street has led to a collapse of Main Street, and we're continuing to see the effects of that today. That 2008 Wall Street crash was present preventable, and it brought misery to multitudes. Economists are still struggling to find and articulate a workable solution to instability in the global economy and have reason for much humility. Dr. Wally's remarks remind us of our duties as scholars to be mindful of the limitations of our knowledge. The social contract that exists between scholars and the public depends on trust and credibility. When the people lose their trust in us as scholars, it's incredibly hard for us to regain it. And let me just embark on a bit of a personal ex excursion here, so indulge me. If any economist or social scientist in the room feel singled out by my comments in the past 30 seconds or so, please know that every discipline must abide by the social contract, and that I made a similar plea to my own profession, the legal profession, at the Canadian Bar Association annual meeting uh, last August. Our inability to find the right balance between regulation and market freedom in our financial markets led directly to the collapse of our economies. It was a collapse, it was a failure of the legal framework that we thought we had put in place. This ideal of balanced integration is a focus of my own scholarly work. Two colleagues and I are working now to unravel how we integrate systemic risk in our national and international financial systems to deal with the too big to fail syndrome in our banking institutions. With uh, two co-authors, I'm preparing the fifth edition of a book called Canadian Securities Regulation, which I first wrote in 1977. And again, just indulge me for a little excursion here, which I find funny, I hope you will. My grandchildren, their eight, call me Grandpa Book. And um, I, this was four years or so ago, five years ago, and I went to uh, the home in Ottawa where our then eldest grandchild, age four, lived, and I read her the book that I have brought, as I always does, do. And her mother said to her, why don't you go and bring your favorite book to Grandpa Book? So she toddled off to her bedroom, and she came out carrying this immense tome, staggering under its load, plopped it down on the floor, opened the first page, and pointed to her name, Emma, and she says, Grandpa Book, that's my name, and you wrote this book just for me. It was the fourth edition of Canadian Securities Regulation. <laughs> she, she had just come into our family at that time. She was adopted from Columbia, and uh, we thought it appropriate to dedicate to her. And having pointed out her name, which I thought was pretty good for a four-year-old, I said, yes, dear, I wrote that just for you. And she said, but Grandpa Book, the next time you write a book for me, will you put some pictures in it? <laughs> In any event, we're working on a fifth edition of this book, which I first wrote in 1977, 
And the legal framework there described attempts to preserve the equilibrium amongst efficient capital markets and consumer protection and trust in the use of other people's money. This work integrates with another strand of my own scholarship. In 1968, I edited a book entitled <coughs> Computers in the Law and later co-authored a book titled Communication Law in Canada, another one called Cyber Law. About that same time, in 1968, another colleague and I wrote two articles in the University of Toronto Law Journal about the checklist society and the certificate society in which we attempted to establish a legal framework <clears throat> that would able, enable people to mig migrate from paper checks and certificates to evidence over ownership to an electronic regime for the movement of money and wealth, an electronic regime to deal with those issues. Well, this was a case of ensuring that the law, that is form, followed the evolution of science and technology, that is function, in reasonable sequence. And that's hard to get right, because law tends to look backward, and it's hard to get right when the function, when science and technology move so quickly. As it turned out, <clears throat> the international electronic movement of financial wealth has been so powerful and so quick that the law has lost its ability to oversee and constrain the most pernicious effects of that change. I don't have solutions to share with you today. I simply note that our scholarship, in the case, the kinds of things that I've looked at with some degree of interest in this area has become much more of a challenge. We must not only integrate economics, history, political science, psychology, law, but also recognize that all these disciplines now operate on a global scale. We truly are interconnected. I hope I have enough time left in my life to do a 10th edition of the, that book. Perhaps after 10 tries, we'll get it right. Speaking of trial and error, the need to continually gauge our work by its effect on the world does not mean that research must always have direct and immediate application. As so many examples, the history of medicine, for example, has proven basic science for its own sake has proven over time to be fundamental to making new discoveries and indeed applications. Yet while we must not hinder new discoveries by placing too much emphasis on immediate results, we must ensure that our learning is attuned to the greater good. Basic and applied research stand at two ends of a spectrum in which success in one leads to success in the other beginning at either end. It's a two-way street. It happens to be a very messy street with lots of movement back and forth, but that's a very good thing, that dynamic. So what of teaching in the 21st century, the fourth and final component in our redefinition of scholarship? As I mentioned earlier, this is a daunting and exhilarating time to be a teacher, the best time in history. As in other spheres of knowledge, the communication revolution is leading to unimagined possibilities for teaching and for the democratization of knowledge. That being said, our students often, usually, have better access to data and some information than do our teachers. Of course, the key question is that question that Pontius Pilate posed to Jesus, what is truth? How do we extract truth out of that very, very broad base of data? The recent decision of Harvard University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to collaborate and offer free of charge thousands of their courses online to anyone with an internet connection is a splendid example of the deliberate democratization of knowledge. And how awe-inspiring that these two neighboring world-leading education institutions are leading the way in making knowledge public for free. Didn't have to happen. They could be involved in their rivalry two or three blocks away, MIT doing its thing, Harvard doing its thing. They could have said we have the, most, the best brand name in the world, our proprietary containment of that knowledge. Uh-uh. They got it together and made it available. I think we should be inspired by that example and we ask ourselves, how can we extend the reach and effectiveness of our teaching today? As a professor, I used to highlight innovations by the banking industry as an example of the transformative use of digital communications. In essence, the banks succeeded in turning each of us into tellers, giving us the ability and the responsibility to manage our financial affairs online. Some of you are old enough in the audience to know that you used to go from 10 in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon and not other, otherwise to withdraw money from your bank account with a withdrawal slip or to present money in with a deposit slip and then that was all handled manually, etc. The banks have been so clever, they've turned us into the tellers. We do all that on an ATM or we do it on the internet back home. Will the communications revolution ultimately have a similar impact on our teaching? If so, how do we as teachers help our students manage their own learning journeys in the face of great complexity? Ce sont là quelques-uns des nombreuses questions qui doivent alimenter nos efforts 
en vue de redéfinir l'enseignement au 21e siècle. For all that is new, however, the central importance of teachers in our lives remains. Along with learning, a smart and caring, te smart and caring society recognizes teachers and teaching as vitally important to our well-being. Teachers synthesize and transmit our knowledge and experience, and they guide and mentor us in varied and profound ways. As I said in my installation speech, which was 18 months ago, Smart and Caring Nation, a call to service, said, if you remember only three words of what I say to you today, they are, cherish our teachers. Let me close by returning to my original call for the deepening and broadening of knowledge so that it's available to all citizens in a given society and to all societies and citizens throughout the world. The current explosion of knowledge requires a parallel expansion in our ability to think critically and imaginatively as citizens. For at the core of democratic societies is the idea that people know enough to govern themselves, and education is the key. Not that we all need to be experts in every field. Instead, we must work to build a society in which we view everything we do as learning, and everything we learn as something to be passed on to others. And remember that most precious Old Testament proverb, blessed is the man who plants a tree, knowing he will not be there to enjoy its shade. Widening of the circle of knowledge is a quintessentially Canadian knowledge. Just think of what we've done in public education and accessibility. We worked hard, in my judgment, harder than any other society to build an education system that balances, that provides equality of opportunity and tries very hard to ensure that equality of opportunity and excellence are conjoining and mutually reinforcing objectives and not exclusive and mutually uh, repulsive objectives. I'm confident that if any nation in the world can be the leader in building a true democracy of knowledge, it's Canada, and we, small country that we are, should be the Athens to the new Romes. And in that same spirit, let me leave you with five questions that may be useful as you continue your discussions over the days ahead. One, what must we do to rekindle the social contract we as scholars have with society in order to ensure we redefine our learning according to the four elements of scholarship that I mentioned? Two, with regard to discovery, how do we ensure we view the ever-expanding boundaries of discovery as a positive challenge and devise new methods and refashion old ones to make the most of discoveries to come. Three, with regard to integration, how do we make our learning global in scope and multidisciplinary in effect? Educate our students to be citizens of the world and as citizens of the mind, ensure all people in the world enjoy that citizenry. Four, with regard to application, how do we apply the best advances of the revolution in communications? And five, with regard to teaching, how do we not only extend the democratization of knowledge, but also work together to ensure Canadians play a catalytic role within it? Merci à vous tous. Du temps que vous m'avez concentré et de votre attention, j'en avais beaucoup à vous dire. Thanks so much for your attention today. I've had much to say, and as scholars, we have much to do if a true democracy of knowledge is our goal. And let me leave you with my two favorite lines from Shaw. Some people see things as they are and wonder why. We dream of things that ought to be and ask why not. Merci. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, for that very uh, thoughtful uh, address on the democratization of knowledge and the, the challenges to developing a truly engaged scholarship for the 21st century. Uh, in a moment, I'll invite uh, Jacqueline Abri Nyman, the President of the United Way of Canada, and Paul Davidson, President of the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada, to join us for a conversation about the call to action that we've just heard. Um, but after a, a, a short uh, uh, discussion and exchange between Jacqueline and Paul, we'll be opening up the forum to uh, questions from uh, the audience uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. Our only limitation is that we're on a strict timeline to finish at 20 minutes after one. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. 
Dr. Jacqueline Abri-Neiman is the President and CEO of the United Way Centraide Canada. She was most recently an Assistant Professor and Executive Director with Queen's University. Jacqueline's research has focused on social value and creation through philanthropy, while her area of practice has centered on resource development, primarily in the Canadian post-secondary context. Paul Davidson is the President of the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. Prior to joining AUCC, Paul was the Executive Director of World University Service of Canada, and he has been personally active in the voluntary sector for some 20 years. Paul has also held senior positions in the Canadian book publishing industry, and has also served as an advisor to the Leader of the Opposition, Treasurer, and Deputy Premier in Ontario. Please join me in welcoming Paul and Jack. Well, in light of uh, His Excellency's call to bolster uh, university community collaborations, uh, I guess Jacqueline and Paul would like to get your preliminary reflections on um, how we can improve that process in Canada. Let me jump right in, and, and Excellency, what a terrific call to action, what tremendous service you're providing Canada throughout your whole career uh, around this kind of work. Uh, let me say, first of all, that you're pushing on an open door. This is something that Canada's universities embrace, and just last October in our centennial meeting, made five bold public commitments about how we can do more in this area. Three of those commitments focus around focus around uh, community engagement, community engagement by students, by faculty, and by the institutions themselves. And so this engagement is something that the universities embrace and want to take to the next level. And that's why I'm so pleased that today's session gives us an opportunity about how we can get to scale in this kind of collaboration. I'd echo uh, Paul's comments and say that the not-for-profit and voluntary sector has an enormous appetite uh, for evidence and research that helps us to frame uh, the work that we do in the community and helps us to uh, execute and advocate uh, as to the expectations that would have our donors and our publics. And so we are very excited to be uh, entering into these discussions as well. So as we move beyond the, uh, the bonne volonté and the desire to go forward, I guess one of the logical questions is to ask, well, what are the challenges? What are some of the impediments? What are some of the obstacles that lie, lie in, in the way of, of this kind of collaboration? I was really struck that His Excellency chose uh, the Ernest Boyer paper because it, it was an important paper uh, some 20 years ago. And, and before we talk about the challenges, I might just touch on some of the tremendous change that, that His Excellency alluded to. I mean, we've talked this morning a little bit about, uh, about the change around students. So first of all, enrollment in Canada has increased by 60%. That means between now and 2017, there will be a million new Canadian bachelor's degree holders. That's a tremendous resource for Canada to, to embrace. And those students are having a very new kind of experience because over 55% of them are actively engaged in volunteering through their university academic uh, commitments. There's also been tremendous change amongst the faculty. Uh, just in the last 10 years, over 50% over of those people teaching today have been hired in the last 10 years. And they bring new attributes, new skills, and new, new desire to work in this area. And then the third area where we've seen real progress is in institutional commitment to doing this. And I'll just say that uh, uh, I've noticed there have been about six universities in the last six months to announce new strategic directions. And uh, all of them include community engaged engagement as a priority that will mean not only a visionary goal, but also resources and structure to support a new kind of collaboration. There are lots of challenges there, and I think one of the biggest challenges is how we get to scale. Because with 80,000 registered charities across the country, with, uh, with the sense of community being both local and global, there's lots of room for us all to do more work. Can I add, you know, there are, uh, as we try to develop these co-created agendas for, uh, for future research and collaboration, that means that we have to value and understand more deeply our uh, ontological, epistemological approaches to research. And so we have to really take into account 
uh, that reciprocal uh, relationship and, and, and the mutual uh, respect and benefit that each bring to the table. And I think there's a lot of goodwill and my own experience uh, in, in university sector has said there's a, an enormous amount of goodwill and as I mentioned earlier, an enormous appetite on the part of communities for this change. So I think there are obstacles. I think that um, many of them uh, can be overcome through articulation agreements and, and also developing what the incentives are for outcomes. I think uh, everyone wants to change society and engage in solving these big and complex issues. Uh, the question is, do our, do our university systems, do our funding systems, do our community systems allow for that kind of integration and, and uh, collaboration? I want to come back to the scale-up issue in a moment, but uh, maybe I can just uh, uh, build on this question about some of the obstacles. Uh, it's not really an obstacle, perhaps, but it's uh, 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 perhaps an element uh, the, uh, of missing momentum. Uh, in the conversation. If we, if we think about the format for today's session, if we think about the challenges ahead, um, presumably not all the potential collaborators and partners are, are represented. So who's, who's missing from the conversation at the moment? Who's miss, missing uh, from this discussion in order to make collaboration and, and connections truly successful going forward? I think there are a number of partners that we can engage with and continue to engage from uh, government at all levels. I think we can also talk on a, on a worldwide scale on what we can do as Canadians uh, to engage uh, a platform that, uh, that goes beyond our borders, that knowledge is a, a boundaryless uh, um, opportunity and I think that we, uh, we, should, we should think about what we're doing in Canada and, and that these big complex social issues are not, uh, are not unique to us in Canada, that they, that they extend far beyond our border in developing and, and, uh, and in developed countries alike. So I think uh, both within our borders and outside we can call, call to action other partners to engage with us. This kind of collaborative effort really does involve expanding the circle. And this morning we had a very good discussion with, with a number of key, uh, key interlocutors on the subject. But those that, that, uh, that I think also have a role to play are the local communities as well, because in, in the sense of uh, the constituency that Jackie works with, the interaction with local communities is absolutely integral, as it is with Canada's universities. I mean, I might, might point out as well that as we move from a concept of ivory tower to community as a petri dish to a place where you transfer knowledge by tossing it over the ivory tower to, to hope the community might catch it, Universities are now really engaged in co-creation and co-learning. Co and, uh, and to do that, it needs a broader circle. So other players can be involved. Municipal levels of government would be one. Another obvious player in Canada, particularly looking at, at the shape and change of our, of our economy, is looking at the role of the private sector to engage. Uh, clearly, there's an interest and a, a volunteer there. We need to find ways of, of accelerating that engagement. Okay, just before turning it open for, uh, for questions from the floor, I want to come back to that scale-up issue because one of the, it seems to me that one of the themes which, uh, which we're uh, wrestling with is the engagement of universities with their community. And almost instinctively, we imagine that that community is a local, local community. So what are the challenges, what, are the, what is the challenge to addressing um, uh, community-wide issues whose scope transcends a particular geographic region or transcends the relationship between a particular community organization and a particular university. I think it's again one of the areas where Boyer's paper was quite prescient about how the communications revolution was going to reduce borders, reduce boundaries, and that, that all problems now are global problems. And so the concept of community is changing. I think it's fabulous that 55% of Canadian university students have some kind of volunteer engagement in the course of their undergraduate studies. I think it's fabulous that there are co-curricular trans transcripts. I think it's fabulous that, that uh, community service learning is now actively embedded on 34 campuses across the country. And that, those kinds of community service learning opportunities can be very local in the downtown east side of Vancouver or in, in downtown Windsor or they can also play roles in policy development at regional and national levels. And when you look at the places for international linkages, uh, His Excellency has also shone a, a spotlight on the diplomacy of knowledge and the fact that because, global challenge, because challenges faced in the world are global in scope, we need to find and develop communities of practice around the world. 
Jonathan. The issue of scaling is, is interesting. Uh, United Way recently, uh, first of all, we're 114 organizations across mm -hmm. the country at a local level. Um, but we act also with a national voice, and we've recently undergone a, 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 re, a, a reimagining of our community impact agenda around three main focus areas. And, and as we do that, we realize that uh, the individual problems, the very complex and localized problems, can be seen also at a systems level. And we're trying increasingly to not only look at these in the very local uh, applied uh, communities, but to look at this as a national, uh, at a national level, and then to try to scale the solutions that we are discovering and developing on a very local level with local partners and local agencies across the nation. So that we're taking that learning to a systems level, that complex thinking to a systems level and, and trying to affect change. I think where that works well with, uh, with the university collaborators is that um, much of the, the, the research that's done in social sciences is generalizable. And so uh, often community agencies that don't have the funding to do, to, to do measurement and, and to evaluate their own programs could look to university partners to look at the type of research that already exists that might be generalizable to their specific context, but that is indeed done at a systems level. So I think there's a lot more that can be done for that translation of knowledge to get us up to that systems level thinking and, and uh, that kind of scalability. Well, let's open this conversation up a little more widely as well. Uh, if you have questions, uh, si vous voulez poser des questions en français, en anglais, veuillez utiliser uh, les micros à chaque uh, côté de la salle and uh, perhaps just identify yourself uh, before, uh, before speaking. Yes. Thank you. David Phipps from York University and also Research Impact, Canada's Knowledge Mobilization Network. Uh, Your Excellency and panelists, I'd like to congratulate you on a shared, bold vision for Canada. A few weeks ago, I participated in a conference on knowledge intermediaries. These are people and organizations who sit between research and policy, or research and practice. And I had the pleasure of convening a panel with people who work with uh, knowledge intermediaries with community organizations or civil society, so relevant to this conversation. I shared this panel with someone from Argentina, someone from Ghana, and someone from Vanuatu. And our similarities in, across these very diverse contexts were much more striking than our differences. So His Excellency's vision for Canada is bold. But my question is, what can that vision and the Campus Community Collaborations Initiative um, contribute to Canada's place in a global society? Uh, as mentioned, I think that there are very few problems that we experience in Canada that are made in Canada. These are problems that uh, are experienced in, in uh, developed and developing nations. So I think by uh, increasing our, our collaboration here in Canada, we not only uh, aim to uh, start to evolve and, and, and uh, move the needle on our own issues, but we can also um, develop uh, uh, some intellectual property that can then be uh, mobilized uh, across nations, uh, across not only our nation, but across, uh, all over the world. So I think the opportunity here is for Cana Canadians to continue to be known as leaders but now leaders in this community campus collaboration endeavor where we can uh, indeed share that, uh, those learnings. Canada is one of the best places in the world to be a scholar, as His Excellency has said, particularly at this time. The significant investments in research and innovation have created a platform on which Canada can play in a way that we couldn't have imagined even 10 years ago. And uh, the ways and places we can, we can play in that regard include, frankly, uh, more intentional relationships with new and emerging economies by creating research collaboration at scale. Each of the granting councils have some resources to facilitate that, but no one is really staying awake at night thinking, how are we going to really penetrate China, India, and Brazil in terms of new, new research collaborations? And coming back to this, the student question, uh, we like to think of Canada as the most open, most global, most trading nation in the world. But you know, fewer than one in 10 students will leave their province during the course of their undergraduate years. And fewer than three in 100 will leave the country. We have to do better than that if we're gonna be full active global citizens in the 21st century. And there are ways we can do that together. Great, thank you. There's a question from the other side of the room. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Luke Gatto. I'm an undergraduate student here at Wilfrid Laurier University. I figured if we're talking about the student's uh, perspective, perhaps we should have one. Uh, I want to frame uh, my question by uh, a plea from a student. I believe that uh, our university students at this uh, present time do not learn the same way that their parents did, but they are being taught the same way that their parents were. 
I believe this is a huge issue. Paul, you're talking about community service learning, and that's what I wanted to talk about. For those of you that don't know, community service learning are uh, courses at universities that integrate into the curriculum with the help of the professor, uh, uh, community service placement. Uh, frequently, these programs are um, integrated into social work or sociology or psychology, because usually our ideas of community service learning are those related to helping those who may not have the means to help themselves. Community service learning as uh, a pedagogical practice really started to take off in Canada at St. Francis Xavier University in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And now, as Paul mentioned, 34 campuses across Canada integrate these programs. The problem is the McConnell Foundation, uh, the McConnell, McConnell Family Foundation, uh, provides a lot of the operating funding for these programs at universities, but they do not guarantee funding. Uh, our Vice President of Student Affairs, uh, Nadia McMurray, recently negotiated uh, a new deal to uh, support community service learning at Laurier with some additional funding, but a lot of our universities, I am worried, when the McConnell Foundation funding runs out, will not be able to prop up some of these programs. My question is this, do you believe that our universities are um, exhibiting their fiduciary responsibility to prop up and support our experiential learning opportunities, and if they do not continue to, my worry is that they may cease to exist and we may take a step back in our, uh, our desire to move our learning forward. Sure, I'll, I really welcome the question, and I'll answer the first part first and then get to the second. Uh, the first part about uh, teaching and uh, pedagogy versus technology. As His Excellency has described, the, the pace of change technologically is so quick that I have to say I don't think pedagogy has kept up with that pace of change. I do think there are a number of very well-motivated and hard-working scholars who are working in this field. AUCC, our organization, works quite closely with the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education to look at new ways of teaching for, a new, uh, for, for the 21st century. When we're talking about the, the global outlook of students today, I mean, it, students today come to, to universities with more global experience in some ways and more, more opportunities uh, than in previous generations. But, uh, but there's still much more that can be done. In terms of the community service learning aspect, this is, this is a, and the resourcing of it, uh, we have to tip, all well, have to tip our hats to the McConnell Foundation for being a very early investor in this. I mean, they funded, I think it was eight initial pilots. It's now embedded in 34 institutions across the country. And the communities are seeing the value of that and students are getting the benefit of that. How we sustain that going forward is a common challenge. And I, I don't often do this because I am a glass half full kind of person. But we have to note that when more expectations are put on universities and more demands are put on universities over the years, we have to look at the resource question. And so uh, it may be interesting, I was looking at some numbers this week, that provincial operating support for universities is per student is now half what it was in 1977. And so while there have been investments in research and there have been investments in expanding accessibility, we have to pay critical attention to issues of quality and sustaining the investments to make sure that today's students have the benefit to be full and active players in, in Canadian society. Did you want to sure, speak a quick well? comment? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, the nonprofit and voluntary sector uh, represents 165,000 organizations in this country, and uh, a, a term that is often heard on university campuses and in, in industry alike is talent management and talent development. And, uh, and that's part of what you're investing here as students in and, and that we assist with in terms of developing uh, at universities. Well, on the receiving side of that now at uh, United Way of Canada and other charitable not-for-profit uh, voluntary organizations, uh, we need that tremendous impact. So there's a full support, and I think part of what we're talking about in terms of the community campus collaboration is that continued uh, service learning uh, um, uh, focus. I think we have time for one more question, and there's one more Thank person. Thank you. The microphone. Um, my name is Ariel Court, and I'm from the Canadian Peace Research Association. And following the very illuminating uh, presentation by the Governor General, and your subsequent comments. I would like to raise the question about, in higher education, the integrity of scholarship. Uh, on Thursday of next week in the afternoon, our keynote speaker is a professor, Peter Longille, and he will be speaking on that subject of academic integrity and whether it is under siege in Canadian institutes of higher learning. 
This is a very critical matter, it seems to me. I'm sure that everybody has in mind what happened many years ago in the United States, which also had its effects in Canada, which was McCarthyism. And that has no place in our view in our institutes of higher learning. If you could be so kind as to make some comments about the how this academic integrity is to be preserved, because without that, we are not dealing with learning, but we are dealing with prejudice. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not sure who wants to take that. I'll, that I'll jump in. I'll, I'll jump in, and I, I really appreciate the question because it is something that I can say university presidents think about every day on their job. It's something that university senates are engaged in. It's something that's, that the federal government has encouraged all uh, grant recipients to, to reflect on. And it's something that is one of the enduring values of the university community. I spoke earlier about the five public commitments that Canada's universities made. And attached to that are five enduring values that we wish to subscribe to. And, and research integrity, academic integrity, and academic freedom are all part of that. And it, again, uh, uh, it was our centennial meeting in Montreal. And uh, it was an occasion for AUCC and Canada's universities to reaffirm the fundamental importance of academic freedom and did so in a statement that's available on our website. This is something that requires uh, constant attention and, uh, and uh, is one that, that uh, Canada's universities continue to be, uh, to be concerned in and taking action on. Uh, part of this conversation is going to be extended uh, from 2.30 to 3.30 when the Canada Foundation for Innovation is hosting a panel um, uh, on, um, on, on innovation in higher education. And that event will be held uh, next door in the dining hall of the Senate and board chambers starting at 2.30, and I just want to alert you to that. And now it's my uh, pleasure to invite Dr. Feridun uh, Hamdulapur, the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Waterloo, to say a few words. Please welcome Dr. Hamdulapur. Thank you, Graham. Your Excellency, it is always, it is always a pl pleasure and honor to, have, to welcome you back here in our region. Thank you for joining us here for, con for Congress 2012 and for confirming what we all suspected. Your continued interest and support for education, scholarship, and community engagement really does raise the bar to previous levels for everyone else. This is a good thing. This is a grand, grand thing. We all benefit from your passion. Canada benefits, and so does the world. At this time, I would like to also give my sincere thanks to today's panelists. Graham Carr, where are you, Graham? <laughs> Jacqueline O'Brien Nyman and Paul Davidson for their passion and insights that were much on display during their discussions earlier. Your Excellency, as you just made abundantly clear with that wonderful address, holding the highest honor in the country hasn't kept your focus from what's happening down here in the daily practice of education. You have, once again, reaffirmed the importance and impact of scholarship and education, and how focused and committed we all want to be in order to face all these exciting challenges. So thank you for that. You have provided a rich start to what promises to be a fertile, invigorating week. It is up to us now to capitalize on, that, on it. All of this is only fitting to your vision since assuming your role of Governor General, your vision for a smart, smart and caring nation. On behalf of all of us here, on behalf of the University of Waterloo and the Wilfrid Laurier University, thank you very much for, again for joining us and have a good afternoon. Thank you.